Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pink Gate's third Warrior Connection. While this may be our first virtual event and we will remain socially distanced, we know we'll be connected spiritually. COVID won't stop us from sharing the most current breast health information and community with our Pink Aid family. Thank you. We have a special lineup with three top medical experts who are fortunate, we are fortunate to have here today. They're the busiest people and yet are taking the time to educate us, address the medical and mental side of what breast cancer patients have to contend with in this changing landscape and answer some of our burning questions. It is my honor to introduce these three heroes working on the front lines every day, saving lives, risking their own, and showing their face of compassion. Dr. Michael cohen is a hematologist and oncologist at Smilo Cancer Hospital, Yale New Haven Health, specializing in breast and lung cancer for over 12 years. As a graduate of Mount Sinai of Medicine, a resident at Brown Medical School, and a fellow at Yale School of Medicine, he now holds a position as assistant professor of clinical medicine at Yale School of Medicine. Dr. cohen Yorm sees patients at Smilo Cancer Hospital care centers in Trumbull and Fairfield. And as you will all see soon enough, he exudes warmth and kindness from the minute he says hello. Dr. Zane Saul is Chief of Infectious Disease and an internist at Bridgeport Hospital, Yale New Haven Health, practicing in Fairfield County for over 30 years. He is an assistant clinical professor at Yale School of Medicine and has numerous publications in scientific literature. He has extensive experience in treating cancer patients who develop infectious disease complications during their cancer therapy. He is also the one on everyone's speed dial, answering questions 24 seven or providing information as a medical expert on television news. Dr. Saul has been working daily on the COVID-19 front lines and will be forever labeled as our hero in our community. Dr. Andrew Anson is a psychiatrist at Bridgeport Hospital, Yale New Haven Health and a fifth year psychoanalytic candidate at the William Allenson White Institute. Dr. Anson works primarily at the Norma Freem Breast Center and has a private practice at the Walt in Brooklyn. He has extensive experience treating individuals with breast cancer and helping them navigate the effects of living with anxiety and trauma. We certainly all need a large dose of Dr. Anson in these confusing and anxious times. Lastly, we have our fabulous president with a multitude, co-president with a multitude of talents, Deb Placey, who will be moderating this morning's event. A big thank you to all of you for joining us today and keeping Pinkade close to your hearts. Enjoy the program because we are so excited for this special event. Thank you so much, Amy. And um, among the multitude of talents I think we've all developed is uh, we've mostly become Zoom experts. I, I hope that uh, you all were comfortable doing this today. I know I can't even type like two O's together <laughs> on my phone or computer and it like autocorrects to Zoom. I'm like, I meant to say soon. I'm not Zooming today. I just wanted to type in soon, but I, I just wanted to give a couple ground rules for anyone who needs um, a little help with Zoom because as we all sort of navigate these times, we're all getting more and more online and virtual. So keep yourself muted. You should all be muted um, unless you, know, you need to, to jump in. And I think uh, there is a chat function we're going to use to help you with that. That way, if you need to get up and walk around or rustle some papers or yell at your dog, we have no problem with that. We have barking dogs all the time in our regular meetings. That's fine. Um, but try to keep yourself muted. And then that way, there's no background noise. There is a chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, hopefully, most of you have used it or are comfortable with it. If you're not, it's no big deal. But as you're listening to the doc, if you get a thought or you have a question that you might want to ask, our um, uh, Pink Aid folks are monitoring that chat. So if I'm too loud, if you can't hear me, if I'm boring you, you can certainly type that in. And if you have a question, certainly type it in and we'll try to take the most common questions or as many questions as we have time for. Um, so th those are kind of the basic ground rules. Did I forget anything? Andrew, is that everything? Okay. Um, so um we will start with uh dr michael can i call you dr michael <laughs> <laughs> you can call me dr. Michael. dr michael the yeah. um 
uh, the, the kind of uh, overview and, and he will uh, expand uh, on each of these and certainly um, is well uh, versed on, on anything else he'd like to get into. But we kind of talked about uh, with Dr. Michael how COVID is affecting breast cancer as it relates to testing and treatment and screenings, which may have been delayed. What the future looks like for breast cancer patients who may need that screening treatment or follow-up visits and then really what are we learning by using hormone therapy as an interim treatment during covid so uh dr cohen Uram, you're up okay um so i will say when this first came out my very first call was to uh to seoul um because we were actually <laughs> heading over to spain to see my daughter was on our semester abroad oh. uh, so he is i i agree he is my my fountain of wisdom um anyway I, you know, this is a, it's a tough talk because we don't have any conclusive data. When, whenever I give talks, I'm so used to having like these facts and figures and trial results at hand, and this is an ever-changing topic. Um, you know, I think probably the biggest thing is we all, doctors, nurses, social workers, all appreciate how phenomenally anxiety-provoking this has been for all of our patients. You know, you people expect to test at a certain time, you know, whether to pick up on something or to reassure them. And now all of a sudden that's been delayed several months. And we, we do not take that as just a matter of fact. We, we appreciate the, the impact that it has on people. Um, in terms of imaging, it's, it's actually been a very well concerted program. Um, I mean, this has been laid out by multiple societies from the American Society of Breast Surgeons to the American College of Radiation, Radiology. Um, none of what I'm going to talk about is set in stone. Everything is on a case-by-case -case basis. So for a routine screening mammogram, yes, it is being delayed. It's considered not elective, but at least not emergent. But if a woman presents with a large palpable mass, if there's a concerning, you know, if they, there's significant skin changes, the woman is going to get her mammogram. She's going to get her ultrasound. If it is essential to her safety and her care it, in a short term. Um, in terms of for the woman who is coming on her routine annual mammogram, again, I, I, and I don't mean to minimize this, the biggest toll from waiting several months for the mammogram is it, it has an emotional impact, but the likelihood of a cancer growing in any significant way in the two to three months that that mammogram is delayed is really, really small. Um, I, I'm not saying it's zero, but it's well less than 1%. Um, and that's part of the reason that they were able to um, come up with these guidelines. Um, screen, I mean, and that's real, in terms of testing, you know, again, if we have a patient who is on active treatment and they need a test that is going to impact their care within a week or two, they're going to get their CAT scan, they're going to get their PET scan, they're going to get their bone scan. Um, believe me, we're willing to pull strings and pick up the phone and use, you know, personal connections when we need to. We're, we're all there to advocate for our patients. And I'm sure that's across the country. Um, in terms of what this is going to mean in the future, I, I, don't, I don't know that any of us know. I mean, you know, everyone talks about a new normal. Um, I personally, for my own mental health, I hope that the new normal is not that much different than our old normal. Um, I think how we screen people has been highly, highly validated. Um, and, and I have a very hard time believing that as long as it is safe to the medical staff and to the patients themselves, that we're going to go back to the same interval testing you know, albeit with a lot of safety precautions. Um, you know, you, I imagine you will still get the letter saying it's time for your mammogram and your ultrasound, but you may get a pre-screening phone call the day before asking if you know anyone is sick, if you've had a fever, you may find yourself, your temperature being taken as you walk in the door. Um, but I, I don't imagine that it's gonna have that big an impact on the timing of the testing. 
although you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of second and third waves of infection. And, you know, we could find ourselves back in this very same position in the fall and the winter. I mean, it depends what, you know, what happens and I guess what media source you believe. Um, in terms of treatment, you know, what it's done is it's forced us just to change sequence, but I don't think any patient has had any part of their treatment omitted. Um, we, for certain cancers, especially triple negative and HER2 new amplified um, cancers, almost across the board, we now use preoperative chemotherapy, um, in part because well over 50% of women will have their cancer eradicated by the time they have surgery. Um, and we think it leads to better long-term outcomes. Um, so that, I think, has allowed us to kind of put off surgery, but in a way that we would have regardless of what was going on with the COVID epidemic. For women with smaller tumors, and especially women with estrogen receptor positive tumors, we're definitely doing much more preoperative therapy and using anti-estrogen therapy, which I'll talk about a little more later. We have always known that preoperative therapy was safe. Um, it's not necessarily been better, but it has always at least been as good as treatment after surgery. The thing is, we're just right now we're using it more and more as a bridge to keep the cancer controlled, maybe to try to shrink it a little, but not necessarily going for the major shrinkage to allow a patient to undergo a radically different surgery. Um, sometimes the expectation is the surgery is going to be the same. It just allows the patient to receive care until surgery can be safely performed. Um, again, if a patient finishes chemotherapy during all of this and they need surgery, they're getting surgery. And I've had several patients undergo breast surgery during this time. Um, and if at any point a patient couldn't tolerate treatment, or we thought that the cancer was progressing in spite of the treatment, they're getting their surgery. So again, nothing is set in stone. Everything is case by case. And I don't think any of us would allow any of our patients to come to any type of harm. Um, in terms of radiation, they've come up with this whole triage platform where some women are felt to be higher risk than others and they have their radiation done sooner. Um, I don't know exactly what the details are of that, but we know from women who get chemotherapy after surgery, sometimes they don't get radiation for five to six months regardless. So we know that that's safe. Um, again, if there is a woman who is felt to be incredibly high risk, they're usually getting radiation within four to six weeks of surgery. Um, so Again, patient safety is by far and away paramount, and I don't think that would stand in the way of any guidelines. In fact, all of the guidelines allow for those gaps so that we can provide the care that we need to provide for patients. Um, again, just going back to the future of screening, I have a very hard time believing that it will become routine for a woman not to be able to get her annual mammogram. Um, again, there are some guidelines from the United States Preventive Task Force that have recommended extending that out to every two years. Um, that certainly was not um, embraced with a lot of enthusiasm, but the truth of it is there are some extremely low risk people that are out there where that may be appropriate. And in fact, that just as I was kind of surfing the web looking for some more information for this, um, the Cal uh, UCSF, San Francisco, um, on their website, they talk about a national trial that's going on called the Wisdom Trial, where they're looking to enroll 100,000 women and whether annual screening, may, maybe even some women may be high enough risk, they need screening more often than one year. But you know, if they find a woman who has absolutely no family history, um, you know, and then looking at how many times they've been pregnant, et cetera, et cetera, they may find that they may be able to undergo mammographic screening even less than two years. But I think that's probably something that is going to occur and inform us regardless of what's going on with the virus. Um, 
let's see. I think the last thing um, has been, what are we learning from preoperative endocrine therapy? I, you know, it's interesting. Preoperative endocrine therapy doesn't lead to the really robust shrinkage that we've typically seen with other chemotherapies. But the plus side of it is that it's not as toxic. So it's much easier to be on and certainly much easier to be on at a time where everyone is so concerned about their immune system. Um, again, we've known it's been safe. We know it's effective. Um, we now are using it more and more for non-invasive breast cancer. Um, and in fact, there had been a phase two trial released earlier um, that actually had shown that when you follow women with MRIs, that preoperative endocrine therapy actually improved what the non-invasive breast cancer looked like on MRI. So again, we know it is safe. Um, as I was talking with some of the other um, members of our group during our multidisciplinary tumor board this morning, one of the things that came up is, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these endocrine therapies are not without their side effects. And obviously, they don't work if you don't take them. But at the same time, it's also tough to ask a woman to take on what initially may just be annoying and which month after month and year after year becomes really burdensome to take on those toxicities long term. And we have been, we, Yale participated in a trial where we were looking at text messaging as a way to bolster um, the compliance that women have with endocrine therapy. And even with a formalized system in place, we found that only 55% of women actually were truly compliant with their endocrine therapy. And I think that's especially aromatase inhibitors. My personal experience, and I was talking with my partner, Dr. Fishback, you know, and again, maybe this is only because women are only being asked to do this over a period of two to three months, you know, as opposed to four and five years, but there must be something about knowing that you're taking the pill and the cancer is still there. But I'm finding that all of my patients are fully compliant with the drugs right now. Whether that'll carry over after they've had surgery, I don't know. Um, but I, I wonder if that just kind of reorients people's mindset and changes, you know, your what you your threshold for tolerance. Um, I think there was one of the other things. Um, going back to um, screening, if you look at all the guidelines from the national organizations, all of them at the end of their statements when they said let's put everything on hold they all conclude with the we will as quickly as possible make a test and even do it on a more accelerated basis to make up for all the women whose tests have been um, delayed so again they, they're well aware of what this means to the women who have been put on that wait list um and and just again again please know that you know, with each patient that we see, this is a conversation between me or another medical oncologist, the radiation doctor, the surgeon. And if we ever think that any of the delays that are being enacted right now are in any way leading to a worse outcome for a patient, we're changing what we're doing. Um, so I, I just hope that everyone knows that. Um, I think that's all I have to say for now. Well, I, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that very reassuring and that we have heard so much in the way we are all getting our information and news and some, you know, fear or trepidation that um, what is elective, like you, like you hesitated to say, and, and what is essential that, it, you know, that you all are full speed ahead and taking care of patients the way you always do. So I mean, that's so wonderful to hear. You answered a couple of the questions, so I have only one left for you, uh, oh. of the questions we got in advance. And that is, would a late stage cancer patient have priority in getting the vaccine once there is one, if there is one, hopefully there is one. And would it be safe, for instance, and I'm probably case by case basis, but you know, your best um, uh, guess is, would it be safe for a cancer patient versus another uh, patient whose immune system might be compromised to receive the vaccine? I don't know. I might have to punt that to uh, Dr. Saul. Um, I, I would hope that the fact that patients are made a priority. I mean, obviously, I think, and again, not to be self-serving, I think the medical 
professionals should probably be top priority just because we'll minimize spreading it to our patients. Um, but I would certainly hope that a vaccine is made more readily available to more, any anybody who's a more vulnerable part of our population. Um, I, you know, it, it, in terms of whether it'll be safe for a patient with a compromised immune system, a, a lot of it's going to depend on whether the vaccine is made from live virus, like the shingles vaccine, or what they call attenuated, like we do with the flu vaccine, which is why it's safe to give the flu vaccine to everyone. But I think I'm going to have to ask the our, our immune, uh, our infectious diseases specialist about that. All right, so let's go to our infectious disease specialist. Dr. Zane Saul is a longtime supporter of Pink Aid. Uh, he is married to the amazing Cindy Saul, who has been with us from day one. And Cindy's sister and Dr. Saul's sister-in-law, Amy Gross, is one of our founders. So she obviously also has been with us from day one. So we couldn't be more excited to have him with us. We have been a bit worried about him. He is on the front lines as an infectious disease specialist. So uh, Dr. Saul, you are up. Thank you, and thank you all for, for having me. Um, I've been in infectious diseases for 30 plus years now, and I never dreamed uh, I'd ever see or be part of a pandemic like we're experiencing right now. Um, the, the, the way that the world has is, is just been ravished by this uh, virus, um, human lives lost, suffering, the economy, jobs, um, it's devastating for for everybody, but just to say, you know, from a healthcare worker that's 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 been there, um, we've not lost humanity. And the stories that you hear are absolutely 100% accurate. Um, I was walking through the ICU and I I saw uh, an ICU nurse um, come out of a room of a COVID patient, a, an elderly man on a respirator, and uh, she had brought in an iPad wrapped in plastic. And she sat and hold this man's hand while he was able to FaceTime his family. Um, and she walked out in tears, just the emotion that everybody is going through. So we've not lost the humanity. Um, so be assured of that. And, and actually now two months into this pandemic, we're actually starting to have some hope. Um, we see the number of hospitalized patients have gone down. We're discharging more patients. The number of deaths are dropping, um, and we're going to slowly start to open back uh, in a very careful way um, the economy. Um, and then even some great news this week was that the early vaccine trials look promising. Um, so um, it's going to take a lot of cooperation, and it's going to take a lot of planning, um, but we do have some hope ahead of us. And and let's get to what this means for, for patients with breast cancer. So. Uh, if a patient is currently on a specific therapy for breast cancer, targeted therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, um, or even radiation therapy, then yes, uh, your immune system is weakened and it will not help you um, uh, adequately to fight against this coronavirus. Uh, it may make you more susceptible to pick up the virus, um, but also it will leave you more susceptible uh, to a severe form of the disease, um, which um, may progress and you may end up um, needing to go to the hospital. Um, now, if you've completed your therapy for more than six months ago, you are at the same risk as the general population. So this only really pertains to people who are on therapy or completed therapy less than six months ago. Let's talk a little more about COVID itself. It's three times more contagious than the flu. And the scary part is that uh, people who don't have symptoms or are carriers are still contagious. Um, for those that get symptoms, they're contagious for 48 hours before they actually get their first symptom. Uh, the virus travels in droplets. It's a rather large virus, and it can get into our eyes, our nose, and our mouth. And it can land on surfaces. We can pick it up on our hands. Um, and so we have to be very careful not to touch our faces, and I seem to have a hard time with that. Uh, the symptoms, as many of us know, are cough, fever, chills, body aches, um, but it doesn't only come with that. You can lose your taste or smell. Um, you can have only GI symptoms, nausea or vomiting, diarrhea. 
Um, 80% of people will have a mild illness and will be able to ride it out at home. Um, things you need to monitor specifically would be um, uh, your oxygen level. And I know many people have picked up these pulse oximeters, um, which you can get at your surgical supply store or your drug store. Um, they're reasonably priced. You put it on your finger and it tells you the percentage of oxygen you have in your blood. And as long as your percentage is more than 93%, um, you're safe to stay at home. But if you're become short of breath, develop chest pain, um, confusion, uh, then you need to seek medical attention either by going to the emergency room, um, calling 911 or, or contacting your provider. So the key really for is protection, for, especially for people that are in increased risk. Um, you really should minimize any exposure you have to any other people that you've not been quarantined with, which means you should not be going to the grocery store. Uh, you should not be going out to appointments. Um, you should really mostly be staying at home to the best of your ability. Have family or friends do grocery shopping for you or run any other errands that you need to have done. Um, if you do have to go out, and we all eventually do have to go out, you need to wear your mask. And um, masks are very important. They need to be two layers of 100% cotton fabric the thread count has to be 180 or higher. So if you're gonna wear a bandana, you need to wear two bandanas. If you're gonna wear a scarf, you need to wear two scarves. The key is hold it up to the light, and if you can see the light through your face protection, um, you've gotta get something that's thicker and will um, protect you more, because like I said, these particles um, are able to get in. Be very careful about how you take off your mask. Take it off by the ears first, and then move it away from your face. You want to avoid touching the outside of the mask. After you take your mask off and put it away, turn to your friend, the Purell dispenser, and wash your hands with anything that has more than 60% alcohol. Um, soap and water will be effective as well. How long do we wash for? Well, this is what we tell our hospital employees. Sing happy birthday in entirety twice. So go through the whole song. You can pick whoever you want to say happy birthday to and um, do it twice. But vigorous hand washing is just as effective um, as uh, using your Pura. Um, social distancing. You know, as we start to move open the country and, and Connecticut specifically, um, make sure you keep your distance at least six feet. We're not 100% sure how far these particles can go. We think they might be able to go longer. Um, so keep your distance. Now, what about healthcare? Dr. Mike just mentioned uh, yes, um, we're doing what we can at all the various uh, facilities. So have virtual appointments with your physician. Uh, there's a lot that you can do, and we've learned a lot about this recently. There's a lot that we can be effective with um, just over a Zoom call like this. Um, try to stay away from your hospital for treatment. Uh, many people had to go to the hospital to get their therapies. Um, uh, many, many of the facilities are trying to move this to the outpatient centers. We have one at Park Avenue in Fairfield. Um, so this can be coordinated very easily with your doctor. Um, you know, common sense, uh, not, uh, not putting yourself into situations where you, you don't have control and you don't know that you may be around people that may have the virus and don't know it because this is where the danger lies. This is where it can be spread. Gloves are controversial. Um, we recommend that you don't necessarily wear gloves. Why is that? Well, because we as human beings touch our face and um, rub your eyes, rub your nose. Um, and again, what's on the outside of your gloves could get contaminated into your face. So again, um, if you're going to the supermarket, if you think you can be really careful um, not to touch your face and you really wanna wear gloves, wear disposable gloves, take them off as soon as you are done and then wash your hands. Um, as a breast cancer patient on treatment, as the world is opening up, 
um, you should not. Um, you should not go to the restaurants. You should not go to the hair salons. Um, you still need to stay home. And let's work through the kinks first of all of, you know, what we're just going to do to open up the country. Um, you stay put and um, wait until we get better at this and more efficient. Um, and then you can get out. Somebody asked about how do we protect our loved ones? Um, well, our elderly families and family members that are probably getting lonely. Um, well, now that the weather is nicer, perhaps we can do things outdoors. Um, if you want to visit an elderly family member, um, meet them outside, stay six feet apart, wear masks, um, good hand washing, and keep your social distancing. Uh, if you are to get sick and um, think that you can ma maintain at home, um, meaning your oxygen level is adequate, you're not short of breath, um, you need to isolate yourself in your home, um, you can come out to common areas, but only with a mask, um, staying six feet away, no hugs, no closer contact, your food needs to be on paper and plastic. Um, and you need to do this for at least a full week from the time you first develop symptoms. Um, and it has to be at least more than 72 hours um, from the last time you had a fever before you can come out of isolation. And the last point is that testing is getting easier and it's getting better. Uh, we don't know yet what these antibody tests mean. Um, they're not up to par as far as the efficacy goes about how, um, how well they are being run. Um, we are getting better, um, but access to testing is getting better. Um, we'll soon be there with rapid testing. We'll soon be there with better antibody testing, but we still don't know if that means you're protected. So particularly if you are at higher risk and you learn that you have uh, an antibody, you should still take all the same precautions that we talked about here because we don't know that that means that you would be protected um, indefinitely. And with that, I think we can open the questions if there are any. Thank you so, so much. Yes. Okay. Have a couple questions. Um, to pick up on something I, I think Dr. Michael had also spoken about, uh, for someone who uh, was treated for breast cancer, uh, uh, how long post-treatment is the immune system restored and then they would be as at risk as anyone else uh to be out and about right so i mean i ideally how when does it really come back it takes four to six months um for the immune system to come back the, the severe part of it um comes back within a couple of weeks um but ideally you know being that we're going through this in in a pandemic um we like to use six months as a cutoff Okay. How about, uh, and I, I, I feel like I'm going to, uh, I know your, we all may know your answer about flying. Is it safe to fly whether you have been in treatment or not? Uh, if you want to go see your grandkids, if you had breast cancer 10 years ago and the immune system is not, you know, at issue, um, whether it's age specific, how do you feel about airplanes where six feet of social distancing isn't possible? Yeah. Um, I'm not ready to get on an airplane myself. Um, we would like to see our elderly parents who are, um, you know, in, in a different state. So I, I think the airlines are, are working hard to try to figure this out. But it's a, you know, as you say, a very difficult situation. Um, I would think I would probably hop in a car first um, and drive to the destination that I wanted to get to before I was ready to get into a plane. If it was essential, that's another story. You take the protection that you can, but I, especially for people um you know that have been through treatment i would say we're not there yet and then i would be remiss if i didn't ask you kind of how we ended dr michael which was uh do you think uh that you mentioned no vaccines that you're some that you're hopeful would breast cancer patients uh be first in line last in line uh, and and would it be safe uh, for a breast cancer patient to receive the vaccine yeah, so like Dr. Mike said, it, it's probably going to be not a live virus vaccine. So it's going to be safe uh, for breast cancer patients to get. And yes, um, the patients that have weakened immune systems are key targets. So um, everybody's going to need to get the vaccine, but those that have weakened immune systems um, should move towards the front of the line. Correct. 
Okay, and then I do have one more um, from an older survivor. Is it more worrisome to wait longer for screening? This is an old, a survivor, so but but an older gal, um, and uh, what, as they're at heightened risk for the virus, which would be the lesser of the two evils, to mask up and go into a facility or to wait it out? So I recently had a doctor's appointment myself this week, and um, a physician's offices were all getting very inventive. Um, Dr. Mike mentioned as well, um, a lot of precautions have been taken. A lot of work has been gone into um, making healthcare environments safer. So I would say call your provider, um, call the radiology um, place where you're going to go to get your screening done, see what, what they've put in for protection. And I would tend to say, you know, we're just going to start opening up now. Maybe not right away, but after a couple of weeks, um, I think I would go ahead and, and get what is necessary done because um, really all the best precautions are, are being put in place. Well, in doctors like you all, we trust. So thank you so much. So interesting. And I know we have more questions. We'll get to as many as we can uh, in the end. And then maybe we'll do a little bit of, of online. If there are a couple questions, uh, maybe we can forward to you uh, later. So we're going to get to Dr. Ander Anson now. It's his turn. And um, we're moving along, which is awesome. And there's so much information here. But the, the psychological effects of COVID obviously are mounting, and especially uh, for cancer patients, those newly diagnosed, that those that have been in treatment, those that are in treatment, uh, it's endless. The strategies maybe that we can use to manage and cope with the confusion and anxiety, that's where Dr. Anson comes in. So we welcome him from his office in Brooklyn and are so pleased to have him and his expertise on our Pink Aid webinar today. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Thank Mike and thanks Zane uh, for everything you contributed. Um, luckily, I'm able to do the work that I do remotely so I don't have to physically examine anyone. So I've been seeing people the last two months from this chair from my home office in Brooklyn. Um, but what I wanted to do was I wanted to give you my theory of trauma um, and not because I want people to walk away from this talk feeling crazier than they already feel living through this moment, but hopefully to be able to have a sense of the way our minds work and have a sense of how we adapt and cope with trauma um, and be able to say, yeah, I know what my body is doing. I know what my brain is doing to try to get through this um, and have some ways uh, to think about that. Um, so my disclaimer as a relational psychoanalyst, I think everybody has trauma. Um, and uh, I take a very liberal definition of what trauma is. So I think to be human means to survive some things. Um, and luckily, our brains have some ways to cope uh, when going through what I'm going to call a trauma. And my definition of a trauma is anything that is beyond the mind's ability to fully process in the moment is a trauma. So right off the bat, to have a cancer diagnosis by my definition, is a trauma. And to be living through the moment we're living in is to live through a cultural trauma. Um, so then you can imagine, so what happens if you have, if, if you're a cancer patient or have re recently got a cancer diagnosis and you're living through this cultural moment, now you have two traumas uh, that you're sort of, your, your brain is having to cope with uh, and struggling to process and can't totally process. Um, and the real variable here, and sometimes with my patients, I use uh, the expression uncertainty with a capital U. So the day you get, the day you hear the C word, you're introduced to uncertainty with a capital U, meaning not knowing exactly where the cancer is in the beginning, the beginning not knowing exactly what the treatment options are, uh, not knowing what the side effects from your treatment protocols are going to be. Um, every time you go in for a scan, not knowing what the next scan is going to show. There's a huge relationship to uncertainty that cancer introduces. Um, and it's, it's something I think even if you're not a cancer patient, you can appreciate having lived through coronavirus because we now all week by week, day by day, have to live with an ex extraordinary amount of uncertainty that we didn't have to face before. Um, so in some ways, this levels the playing field for the kind of uncertainty you have to find a way to live with. Um, but the two parts of the brain that I want you to know something about, um, and I'm not going to do an exam on brain anatomy, but if you see 
everybody can see now this image of the brain that's popped up on the screen. Um, I'm, I know you probably can't read all the words. Um, the little yellow balls um, are the amygdala. Um, and then the blue, um, what early brain anatomists thought looked like a seahorse um, shape is the hippocampus, which is Latin for seahorse. Um, these are the sort of parts of our brain, and I'm oversimplifying the brain, obviously, um, but these are the parts of the brain that were sort of adapted for us to be able to cope with a trauma. So I want you to think of the amygdala as like the triage nurse. And so the triage nurse in the emergency room is the one who has to decide what is dangerous, what can be ignored for a little while and is not emergent. Um, but it's the part of the brain that says this sensory information is crucial and important and worth paying attention to. It's the red ticket item. Um, so the amygdala is your triage nurse. The hippocampus is like the part of the brain that's associated with um, any kind of emotional memory um, and emotional memory association. So if you think of uh, a smell that will call to mind your grandparents' house um, or a moment from childhood, all those things get stored away in the hippocampus. Um, and what begins to happen um, the minute you're in a situation where what is going on is beyond what you can emotionally process, both the amygdala and the hippocampus kick in in some interesting ways. And up at the top of this image here, I've drawn a continuum. So you'll see on the side of the brain that's sort of closer to the amygdala, it says hypervigilance. Um, one of the brain's coping mechanisms is to have a hypervigilant response. So that's when your amygdala is saying, <clears throat> Potentially everything is a danger and I need to be on alert to make sure I am identifying dangers and ticketing them appropriately so as to survive and not miss an unidentified danger. Um, on the other end of this continuum, I've, I've written dissociation. Um, and that is one of the brain's sort of coping mechanisms at the point at which you can't possibly pay attention to everything. And in fact, it would sort of overwhelm the system to be able to do that, your brain kicks into safe mode. Um, so when Windows can't restart, your computer restarts in safe mode, that your brain has its own way to do that. Um, uh, and so uh, this is the point at which the hippocampus kicks into gear and gives your brain a break. So things that can't be processed, that can't be dealt with, that there needs to be some way to remove from conscious thinking, and store in some part of the brain until it is less overwhelmed and less overloaded to begin to process that information. That is what the hippocampus is designed to do. Um, so um, all of us have, through the way our brains were designed, through evolution, the ability to use these structures. They're there. We need to use them. Um, and if you imagine sort of a day in the life of coronavirus, probably multiple times a day, we have to sort of rely on these mechanisms. Or you could find yourself on either sort of extremes of this continuum at different parts of the day or different parts of the week. Um, and that is normal. What I tell all of my patients is there is no, there's no normal um, response to trauma because trauma by definition is an abnormal event. So there's just a response to trauma and no two people's response, depending where they are in this continuum, is going to look exactly the same. Um, it may not be the same at different points um, of this process. It might not be the same now as it was a month ago. Um, um, but I want people to sort of have a sense of that is how their brain works so that people can begin to self-diagnose in a more accurate way. Yeah, I know why. I couldn't concentrate on that Zoom call. My hippocampus was giving me a break and I was in a more dissociated uh, place. Um, but the other kinds of things to look for or the less sort of medically jargoned things, I think still fit in that continuum in some ways. And these were the sort of finer print things that were on that slide. Um, um, let me just pull up my version. Um, so on the hypervigilant side, the people would have an increased startle response or would be jumpier or would wake from sleep easier. Um, these are the things that should show up on the left side of this um, continuum. Uh, having more obsessive thoughts, so finding yourself obsessively worrying about what's going on in the news, 
um, or obsessively researching all the lit literature on your cancer diagnosis and the treatments. That would be a normal one. Um, to have any kind of panic or anxiety shows up on that side of this coping mechanism. Um, insomnia, I mentioned, on the other side of this continuum are kind of what are I, I'm calling the more dissociated coping mechanisms. So to have poor concentration, to find yourself avoiding more, um, to sleep more or to use sleep actually as an escape, to take a nap in the middle of the day. I'm guilty of that one. Um, it's a hazard of having a couch in your office. <laughs> um, feeling more depressed, this sort of persists. Um, and that's part of what I watch out for. Using denial, having days when you stop, uh, stop living in fear, stop worrying, take other risks because you can't be bothered to worry about dangers. Um, that is a pretty common one. Um, so um, if those are the way these sort of coping mechanisms would manifest, um, what do we do with that? Um, uh, the take home message I think would be, um, and when I've worked in um, crime victims trauma centers for populations of people that really struggle with trauma, the question always comes up, how do you unbake a cake? If this is what happens to the brain in the context of a trauma, how do you reverse the process? And the shorter answer is, it takes time, and I think probably the most effective thing is talking. Because if part of what happens is things that can't be fully processed uh, have to get put into the hippocampus, and it's the black box then that sort of seals away things that can't be dealt with until it's safe enough to take off a piece of that and fully begin to process. When you talk about something, you symbolize it, you begin to put it into words, you begin to create a narrative you know, about what you're experiencing and sort of by definition, we don't talk about things we're not ready to talk about or to put into words, um, but just having someone else that you're using language to communicate some as aspect of this with means you've begun the process of pulling something that was in the black box of the hippocampus back out into the parts of the brain that be could begin to deal with it um, and transform it into something that is less traumatic. Um, and so I don't care if that happens you know, with friends or family or with a colleague um, or with your therapist online in a Zoom session or even with your psychiatrist, but um, that is the slow work of how people across all different kinds of cultures and communities begin to do that. Um, and I think there's no way to accelerate that process. Um, so in the same way, uh, you know, recovering from having just finished your cancer treatment and now going uh, into the slow process of rebuilding your life and experiencing the new body that you have is, is not gonna happen the weekend after you finish your chemotherapy. It's gonna be a journey um, over the course of, I tell people, months to that first year after you finish your treatment. Uh, as you're processing some things you couldn't process while you were getting to the finish line of your cancer treatment. Um, the same thing I think applies to adapting and adjusting to this. Um, uh, and so the hardest variable of that, I think, is not knowing how long that takes. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a number I can't usually give people, um, but the process looks like um, finding some safe place and space to begin to talk about that with someone. Um, um, when, when on either ends of this continuum, things get to the point where someone is having anxiety symptoms to the point of having panic or physical symptoms of anxiety, then I usually have a conversation with people about using an antidepressant class medication to treat anxiety. Um, not that that you know, medicates the trauma. Um, there is no medicine for a trauma, but in terms of helping someone cope with symptoms on that end of the spectrum, that would be safe. On the other end of the spectrum, when someone is associated to the point of feeling really depressed and socially, uh, isolated um, and avoidant, you know, then I would treat the depression also with some of the same medications. Um, where people tend to get into trouble um, is, um, you know, there is an urge to sort of use stimulant medications when someone feels so dissociated they can't concentrate. Um, and you maybe have had friends or coworkers and they're 
workplace who've mentioned not being able to sort of concentrate at your usual level while working from home in the pandemic, and that is normal. Um, the danger is most stimulant medications actually push someone to the other side of this continuum where you would actually end up being more hypervigilant, having more anxiety, and then you have a medication that sort of uh, flips the brain's coping mechanism, um, but usually to the expense of having other kinds of symptoms. The reverse is true. So when you have someone who's really anxious or really hypervigilant or really jumpy, and you treat those people with sedative hypnotics, Xanax, clonopin, the danger is that comes oftentimes at the risk of making someone more dissociated. And the brain knows how to, to do this dance. So when the brain feels uh, too hypervigilant, the brain has its eventually its own inborn mechanism to sort of shift someone to a more dissociated place. And the opposite is true. Um, um, so when I'm exploring medications with people uh, to stick to antidepressant class medications when symptoms have reached that point, um, but what I want the take home message to be um, is uh, I think people have to have some way to process what's going on um, um, and to talk to someone about it because that is sort of the brain surgery that uh, day by day you're conducting with the brain's coping mechanism to pull something out of the hippocampus um, that doesn't have to be uh, stuck in the black box in the same kind of way. Um, and so I think that's equally true uh, with a cancer diagnosis. I think it's true for everyone now living through a coronavirus um, pandemic. Um, in some ways, I think this particular kind of pandemic really attacks some of our ways to know how to do that. So, you know, even the people you would have talked to at the water cooler, um, that now you have to make an effort to stay in touch with and to process with. Um, and even my, my therapist, psychoanalytic colleagues have bad days where they don't want to talk to anyone and don't want to turn on a Zoom call. Um, so um, I think those are the kinds of things that um, slowly we're figuring out a way to sort of work back into our lives. Um, so I applaud Pink Aid and finding some way to make this happen because um, I think it's really important to have people uh, have other ways to feel connected and, um, and talk to people. Um, with that, I'll open it up to questions I didn't speak to. Well, th thank you so much. It's, it's always so interesting to learn that there are physical reasons for how we feel emotionally. Um, and sometimes, you know, those, those physical uh, things that affect our emotional well-being, that they come from a physical place. I, I, I'm curious, uh, one of the questions we had is, are, you know, because I know we know you specialize uh, in seeing cancer patients, but is there a heightened sense of anxiety because uh, one is a cancer patient? Are you hearing more from cancer patients, former cancer patients, or, or would you say that the same level of, it, of anxiety um, among the public in general? Um. I think it's hard for everyone, but it, for cancer patients, I think it's insult to injury. So I think most of our brains have sort of like a quota of the amount of uncertainty we can deal with day to day. Um, and what's tough is multiple different moments in cancer treatment usually sort of saturate someone's ability to do that. Um, but this is just one more huge uncertainty you add into the picture. So I've, I've spoken to a lot of, a lot of cancer patients who you know, and not knowing how soon life goes back to normal, um, uh, not knowing when more elective kinds of things would be possible to schedule. Um, that still is an uncertainty that someone has to live with. Um, I think there has to be some place to talk about those worries and those concerns. Um, I think it's doubly hard um, for people uh, who are home alone dealing with this, who have family members who have to work. Um, uh, to get through um, this particular moment. Um, um, I think it's especially hard for people that aren't fluent in technology to use Zoom um, or a video session to connect, um, but still need to have some ways to stay connected. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, absolutely, it's a special uh, extra layer of uncertainty that I think cancer patients have to deal with. 
Okay, so I have one more question. And then I also, we're also gonna ask you about the teleconferencing in terms of telehealth, which also we want the other two doctors to jump in on before we go, if that maybe is you know, something we're gonna see more and more of in, in the future. One more for you though, do you think TMS therapy is helpful for people dealing with trauma? One of our participants said that she's seen a lot of information about this lately. Mm -hmm. um, I think TMS is helpful. I think having, um, I, I think that there's, there's no one solution um, for any individual patient. I think meditation, mindfulness, having some way, um, especially if you were on this hypervigilant side of the continuum that I put up there, um, to have some ways to feel uh, like you could self-soothe, to get in touch with a different kind of rhythm. Um, for some people that's going for a walk or listening to music. Um, I have patients who, Baking is that um, way to get to self-soothe and stay in their body in a different kind of way. On the flip side of that continuum where someone is feeling dissociated, I find those patients need to find some way to feel stimulated. So I watch Game of Thrones, even though I know it's a little violent because it boosts your dopamine and it's high drama. Um, How do you feel it, about Dead to Me? <laughs> dead to Me could count too. Um, getting some exercise could do that for people. Endorphins have that effect. Sex does that for people. Chocolate, caffeine. Um, so I think that there are a number of things, even if you didn't know, that's why you were gravitating towards those kinds of things. I think your, your, your body and your mind knows that's part of what you need in those moments as well. well um, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Tell, for anyone who, who doesn't know, what does TMS stand for? Um, uh, so you're referring to um, therapy. What does that TMS stand for? For um, um, I'm blanking on what the okay, what the, oh, but, but it's it's more of the wellness uh, side. Okay, because uh, I don't know what it what it stands for. I think it's transcendental meditation. Transcendental meditation. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Listen, that is a way of being participating in your body um, of. Uh, allowing the brain to, if you're on this one side of the coping continuum, to shift itself more towards this middle country between hypervigilance and dissociation. Um, to be able to participate with your body allows people to feel a sense of agency, which I think becomes particularly important, especially if you're living in a world of uncertainty and have lost a lot of agency. Um, so. Uh, I think that's a fabulous way to um, incorporate that into um, a routine during a pandemic. For other patients, I think med meditation is a way of getting at that. Um, uh, and I have patients who just in therapy sessions with me will want to sit in a different sort of virtual space um, and talk or not talk uh, and experience breathing in a different mindset for 45 minutes while they're uh, connecting to me virtually in a different space. And I think that those all are valid ways of, of affecting something about that continuum that we talked about. Okay, so uh, Dr. Cohn Urim and then Dr. Saul, each of you, what do you think about telehealth? Is it the future? How do you, you know, I, I think there are patients who love it. Uh, and and we, we, we want to know how you doctors feel about it. It obviously works for uh, for Dr. Anson and, and his field. What do you all think? Um, I, I've been actually pleasantly surprised by it. I, I, at first, I felt like it was such a poor substitute for actually seeing somebody and laying hands on them. Um, now I kind of view it as a privilege, like it's you're welcomed into their home. You can see artwork on their wall. Sometimes a pet will go by. Um, and I think it's so nice to be able to stay in touch with our patients and know that they're safe. You know, obviously, you know, it, it's not a substitute for everything. I think if a patient has a complaint or a problem that you really need to examine, you have to reconfigure. Um, but, but I think it's been a really, really nice medium by which to stay connected and continue to care for our patients. Dr. Saul, what do you think? And I think it's going forward in the future, it's going to complement um, the way we do healthcare. So um, I think when you call to make an appointment for uh, a provider, they're going to say, do you want an in-person appointment or do you want a telehealth appointment? And I think there are going to be 
uh, issues that are appropriate for both. And um, I think it's been a, a great asset to have this uh, during these times. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, Andrew, do you want to jump in and, and wrap up do you have anything else? Oh, I hear a dog. I love it. Gina. Sorry. Gina. Gina, come here. No worries. It's not a Zoom call without someone barking. Exactly. Um, so for those who, my name on the screen says Pink Aid Warrior Connection, but I'm Andrew Mitchell Namdar, one of the, the co-founders of Pink Aid. Um, and we are just so thrilled to be able to offer this kind of webinar today to everyone. Uh, first shout out to Donna Twist for helping organize some of the doctors here today. Um, thank you very much for all you do, but also specifically to the three of you, Thank you so much for bringing your knowledge, your insight, your compassion, and your kindness today to the over 60 people who've been on this call today. We are so appreciative. Um, you all were our heroes kind of pre-COVID, and now you're kind of like our superheroes that you're continuing to go into the hospitals, into your medical centers, and treat um, all these patients. Um, bravo also to all of your staff. I know a lot of times doctor staffs have been re you know put through different areas in the hospital so thanks to them and also thanks to your families you know it's very stressful for families of medical and essential workers to have their loved ones you know in greater harm's way so you know i see a few souls on the the participant list but really thank your family for all of us and all that you do um and finally just to everyone out there um, in all the participant land, you know, I'm joking, sitting on my, my pink throne here, which, you know, was uh, an auction item from our first event, which is coming up on 10 years ago. Um, this is my office chair and I love it. It reminds me of my true love for Pink Aid. Um, and to, we see a couple of people from Long Island who are coming up on their seven year anniversary. We don't know what our events will look like this fall, but we do know that the need is greater than ever for um, people who are going through treatment, um, people who are struggling, people who've now been laid off going through treatment. They need their lights on, they need their electricity, they need their mortgage. And Pink Aid and the Pink Purse is there to help. So thank you all for joining today. Um, and with that, I just wish everyone keep spreading the kindness, keep spreading compassion. Um, and, you know, only through these things together will we kind of, you know, get through it all. So bravo to you all and thanks from all of us at Pink Aid. Thank you all so much. Stay safe. Mwah. Thank you all. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. So grateful. Thank you for arranging this. It was wonderful. Thank you. All right, bye all. Thanks again. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.